moderator's prerogative real quick, just two points I want to make. Uh, all of that investment that he talked about, private dollars. Government wasn't putting that money in. They invested in all those technologies that are lagging. Second thing, I'm so happy to hear that physics will be overturned <laughs> because I've asked climate scientists, alarmists, consistently what it would take for them to be convinced global warming is not happening. And the only one who gave me an answer to that question was Michael Mann. And he said, all of physics would have to be overturned. <laughs> Give it time. Um, good, good. A couple, a couple comments on, on what has already be, been said, but I never thought of it before, but um, being in an environmental regulatory agency is serving a term. But I'd like to report, although, and I don't intend it to, to um, be any kind of arrogance, it's possible to govern very conservatively. It's possible to govern an environmental regulatory agency with good science. Texas is maybe a different place, but I think of, uh, he may have spoken at some of the previous Heartland conferences, the chief toxicologist at this environmental regulatory agency is, is a fabulous, fabulous sound scientist who knows that toxicology gives you more meaningful information than ecological epidemiological studies, about, and, and that EPA's current use of, of um, and you all I'm sure know as a non-scientist about uh, these things better than I do, but no safe threshold linear regression, linear regression analysis is not the way you set environmental standards because that leads you to find the same amount of risk at, as, the, as the pollutant concentration approaches zero as you do almost at the higher. If you want to know where EPA's mega rules are coming from, it is a, from an abuse of science using that methodology. And then I, I think I probably could stop because wouldn't you rather ask Mark questions about that fascinating <laughs> presentation than listen to me? But I, I want to first thank this, um, this, this foundation, this institute, the Heartland Institute, for what they have done on this issue. All of those who are part of Heart, Heartland on their staff, but also all of you here and many others that have been a part of this. Because among other things, I would like to uh, attribute to, the, to all that Heartland's done um, and through these conferences and the many, many people that write and speak and work on all these issues is that we at least move from um, anthropogenic global warming to climate change because the, 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 the problem about um, no real warming for a good amount of time I think really has taken home. But what has that given us? It's given us, I think, a word with a, uh, without meaning or a phrase, climate change, because it means everything. It means warming and cooling and drought and flood. Um, it means mostly bad weather in the, um, the words of our presidents. And it made me think about um, a passage in um, the book Alice in Wonderland. And Alice is talking to Humpty Dumpty. And it's a discussion about words and what meanings words may or may not have. And Alice says something to the effect of, um, can you make words have different meanings, or can words have different meanings? And Humpty Dumpty says, and these are hardly quotes, but something to the effect, ah, oh, you've asked the right questions. It's only who controls the meaning of the word, which is what I think is going on in our political arena, where uh, pure propaganda, where the word carbon can mean um, the chemical basis of life, or it can mean a weapon of mass destruction, in the words of our Secretary of State. But actually, to me, I'm an optimist, very much an optimist, like Mark is, but I worry, unlike these you know, apocalyptic predictions of, of some sort of planetary meltdown, this issue is more institutionalized. You know, the predictions of overpopulation and all of that, this is, is, insti is, is institutionalized into, in rulings of our Supreme Court in much of what EPA has put in place. So I, I, I and, and I, it, when in doubt, I would trust Mark's assessment of this more than mine, because I'd like to think the inertia that you're talking about, is, is, it actually is a physical force. Um, that may, may trump this, but I worry the extent to which all this is institutionalized. Energy is a big deal in Texas, as you might have mentioned. I'm very proud that um, Texas has led the shale revolution that um, is of all the, the increase from shale. Um, Texas has produced the overwhelming majority three times even more than North Dakota has, which is a miracle story. And I'm also pleased that uh, the, the, the man most widely called the father of fracking, George Mitchell, 
um, was from Texas, and very pleased that his parents arrived as penniless Greek immigrants in Texas, and he put himself through school um, as a tailor and ended up working, working, working with this technology um, to, in fact, crack the code that many thought um, at that time was not possible. So in the work we do at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we're 25 years old, but we just grew from, it just grew in the last half a dozen years from about 10 employees to 50. You might notice that that does coincide <laughs> with a very good <clears throat> um, performance by the energy sector in Texas. We have started a, an initiative, um, we call it a Fueling Freedom, uh, which is really, it's said in another way, it's about energy and climate policies but um, that to really distill the, the kind of fundamental um, energy realities as from, again, from the most elemental to the grand sweep, that policymakers and the general public can be really conversant with. I mean, I think the, the, the status of this issue in the upcoming presidential campaigns is critical. And a lot of those who might agree with our perspective are often still extremely uncomfortable with um, openly, um, openly talking about it. Um, I am pleased to have uh, been invited to write a book based on a really little paper I did on the, the um, colossal energy benefits that mankind has accrued from uh, abundant and affordable energy, which just happens to be uh, fossil fuels, <clears throat> that's called fueling freedom. Um, how abundant energy has transformed the human condition and released billions from poverty. Um, I think something not at all well realized by the average voter or the average policymaker is how utterly dependent um, modern civilization is on the consumption of and it's been fossil fuels. And that's just saying in another way what, what Mark said. It's like um, I'm a, I, I, I have take great delight in the books of Vaclav Smil. How many in here may enjoy Vaclav Smil's book? Not many. Not many. You've got to read him. He's written, one, he's written about 80, and I, I, I don't want to use up too much time, but he uh, proudly calls himself an energeticist, which as a term for a kind of interdisciplinary study of all the roles that energy plays in the natural world, in the biosphere, um, as well as um, I mean, the, in just human life and, and the economy. But he is a master at looking at this, I think, this grand uh, sweep. He's at the University of, of Manitoba. He comes along with, I think, probably most of them in this room would all the way till you get to climate science. He's critical of everything else, but for some reason he cedes the ground um, to climate science, which may solely, uh, but fascinating, fascinating, his depiction of this uh, the energy, global energy system, both natural and, but particularly the man-made, is, is as important to modern civilization as the metabolism in the human body, which is what controls, and all the parallels that there are in those. And um, I, I, you know, the, the, the bulk of the energy benefits we have received is so recent. It's since 1950, the real, the big, I'm <laughs> checking to see if my, uh, my numbers are right. It's, it's, it's only a couple generations. And I think, you know, and it, it's, 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 it's mundane to say, well, we just don't know how good we have it, but we don't have any, most people don't have any conception of how absolutely critical energy is to, um, to their life. The, the, the Industrial Revolution, of course, is the period um, when, for the first time, fossil fuels were harnessed in a methodical way, and, in fact, that we turned <clears throat> the heat and chemical energy and fossil fuels into mechanical energy. The productivity, the vast increases in income per capita, and the, pro and the economic productivity um, that we've had since um, that first use in England is just is mind-boggling, the amount, the extent to which that, that has improved um, human life. There's, <clears throat> in the book I'm writing, in a project that we are t taking on at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which has many components, one of which, and I just might, before I forget, Doug Domenech in the room? Well, I don't think so. Anyway, he is um, someone that is also working for the Texas Public Policy Foundation on, on this initiative in the um, regulatory arena and with, with multi-state efforts, but um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling for the word because more and more people are talking about the benefits to human welfare of energy, the moral case for fossil fuels and all of that. You know, it's to me a, a very, very important to communicate 
uh, in a broad scale, and I know m maybe perhaps most of you in this room are, are very technical scientists, but to uh, figure out how to really communicate um, <clears throat> all of what we conclude with now the facts on our side um, to those that are going to be making policy de decisions in, in the, <clears throat> the near future. Um, energy amplifies human life in the same way a fertilizer amplifies um, the growth of that plant. I think that might sound, again, obvious, but um, it's profound. What is, it, what is the greatest benefit of man-made energy? It's, it's time, a very profound benefit. It's time not only in a lifespan three times longer than was enjoyed um, um, around the time of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. It's, it's phenomenally more time, and from time comes choice. And from choice comes innovation and freedom and the opportunity for true human flourishing. I think it's a misnomer to call the Industrial Revolution the Industrial Revolution. I think it shouldn't be called the Great Energy Enrichment, uh, for it was on all scales. As, as colossally successful um, in industrial and economic matters as in agriculture. The story of, of the, the use of fossil fuels in, in agriculture and in Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution's um, development of, of, of plant types that really worked kind of like a mechanical device that, that maximized the, the intake of, of the anhydrous ammonia fertilizer and also increased photosynthetic efficiency. Amazing, amazing gifts, and they're so recent, so, so recent. Um, did, and I'm going to close here in a second, did anybody read um, about the Google engineers who had been hired to develop a, you know, multi-billion dollar fast path to the totally renewable green economy? Um, did anyone see that? Um, do you know what they concluded? They concluded, and they were warmists themselves and delighted to have all this money behind them to chart the roadmap. They concluded, and this is in print, um, the best source I've found is in, a, I believe, a British publication called The Register, renewables are a false hope. They will not work. These were green, green, greenies reaching this conclusion. You don't, didn't see it very much in, the, in any kind of major press, but they concluded very much on the basis of science that, in a nutshell, far more energy goes into uh, electric generation by any kind of wind or solar uh, source then comes out. And that because of the ex extraordinary low power density, vast, vast acres of, um, of the surface of the earth would have to be commuted, and that the amount of heavy industrial material that's involved in that, that it is, it is, it is beyond the pale. Uh, but I would think that that conclusion coming from that, or, that arena would be a help. But oh no, just this week um, comes into my email uh, more. These are actually Stanford engineers that were on the Google project, and these were also Stanford engineers that has now a plan that um, really by 2020 we can get almost to 100 percent renewable. And the little, little, little side, but the, you know, these are c credentialed scientists at what some people would call a prestigious university. Um, but with just a few, a few little qualifications, that involves 40% less energy consumption, which would take you about to 1950. And go Google vehicle miles traveled in 2050 versus now. It is so, the, the increase is of such vastness, it's mind boggling. Oh, but it will stimulate the economy, according to these fine Stanford engineers. And they used uh, EPA's absolutely fantasized calculation of the social cost of carbon as the economic stimulus. You know, it's, it's, it's cost avoided, but it'd be three trillion a stimulus to the economy, so these engineers say. Um, and I, so I think they better stick to applied sciences rather than policy making. Thank you very much.